I used to tell my students that if you're somewhere and you're singing a song and then you hear all the tutus laughing, you'll know why. Because you probably mispronounced a word and and you didn't even realize it, but you mispronounce a word, it changes meaning. And so in song contest time I would go around and talk to them about them, the different meanings and I so you know you you have to draw pictures for them so you say the word mai and mai and so you want to use the word mai and you say mai well you know mai can be to be ill but mai can also refer to the genitals you know so as in a mele mai another word I, they, that comes up in songs often is the word lia and lia has to do with yearning desire and so you're you're desiring someone and if you don't put the okina there you're saying lia and do you know what lia are like liha they're little baby ukus <laughs> they're uku knits baby and so then they start oh no you know and you show them the these um these differences and then they realize wow so now well, and you know, for many years, the students are really, really concerned about pronunciation. Sarah Kiahi expected to be surrounded by Hawaiianness when she started teaching at Kamehameha schools in 1966. Instead, she found that there were no Hawaiian studies courses and that she was the only Hawaiian language teacher. She advocated relentlessly for Hawaiian language and culture to be taught. And by the time she retired 37 years later, there were 10 full-time Hawaiian language teachers and a mandatory Hawaiian studies curriculum firmly in place. Sarah Kiahi, next on Long Story Short. Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox is Hawaii's first weekly television program produced and broadcast in high definition. Aloha mai kako, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Sarah Patricia Ilialoha Kwaifa Ayat Keahi is remembered by many of her students by her previous married name, Mrs. Quick. Generations of high schoolers at Kamehameha schools took her Hawaiian language classes. In the broader Hawaiian language speaking community, she's known as a champion who fought to perpetuate the language when it was increasingly marginalized. Today, the Hawaiian language is thriving thanks to the efforts of Sarah Kiahi and other like-minded people in the 1960s and 1970s. Sarah Kiahi's love of Hawaiian culture and language started with her family and with growing up on Hawaiian homestead lands in Honolulu. I was born and raised on this island um, in Kaimuki, we were living with my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, Sarah Kiahi. Eventually, we moved to Papakolea and settled in Papakolea. Is that because you were granted a homestead lot? Right. My mom was granted a homestead lot in 1950. And when we moved to Papakolea, my mom was pregnant with my, with our, my youngest brother, you know, her 10th child. <laughs> And so we moved up there in December, early December in 1950, and my brother was born in February of 1951. Ten kids, yeah. mom and dad. How big and was your house? I mean, I can't imagine 12 I know. people in a house. We all had bunk beds, and of course, in those days, we only had one bathroom. It was a wonderful life because we, we raised, um, we had chickens and ducks to eat. And we had... You um, raised your own chickens and ducks and then you'd yeah. have to kill them to eat them, yeah. farm to table. Yeah. See, my mom would go out, get a chicken, kill it, clean it, cook it, and serve it. I couldn't do that. I'd have to go to Costco, you know? Well, those feathers that your mother took from the chickens, did they go anywhere since oh, you yes. used everything? She made feather lays. She did? Yes, she did. My mom Where was... did she get the time to do all this? <sighs> That's a good question, you know? She was an incredible woman. Her thing was, um, if you see something needs to be done, you do it. Don't wait to be asked, just do it. She's amazing. I mean, she was a homemaker. My dad worked, and but my mom made all her clothes. She cleaned the house and she put fresh flowers and plants every every week. You know, she'd go out and cut things and bring it in, and and I think that's why my love of gardening. I love I love gardening and I love flowers and plants. My friends would call and they would say, "Who's that Holly woman that answered the phone?" I said, "That's my mom." Your mom? 
is she Hawaiian? <laughs> I said, well, yeah, she's half Hawaiian, you know, half Hawaiian, yeah. So but, she spoke standard English? Oh, yes. We had and to did speak. she, oh, she insisted you we do too. We had to speak standard English in the house, yeah. If we were outside with our friends, you know, we could speak pidgin and everything, but when you came in, you had to speak standard English. Was there a drill with the kids oh. so that um, the older kids would take care of the little kids yes. to take some of the pressure yes. off her? Yes, yes, and she assigned each of us sister, older sister, to one brother, and so we had to make sure, you know, that their, their teeth was brushed and everything like that, but my mom ran a quite a, quite a tight ship, but she was super organized, and then she went out and entertained at night. My, my mom was, uh, had studied hula in the early days. In fact, Iolani Luahine was one of her hula sisters. So we were involved with hula, and we were involved with pageantry and um, Aloha Week. And when Auntie Elsie Ross Lane was living, they had wonderful pageants every year. And we were always in the pageants because my mom was a costume director for Aloha Week, so she even I'm made the... costume. It, no. you know? <laughs> What was your dad like? What kind of a match were they? <clears throat> My dad was a really easygoing guy. He was a really easygoing, hard worker. Really Two hard, hard workers. Two hard workers. You know, my dad, he would come home from work after working all day, and if there was a, a, a pail of clothes to hang up, he'd hang it on the line. If there was some something to iron, he'd pitch up and iron. I mean, he was, you know, um, he painted our house about every five years, my dad did. We had an emu in our yard, so my dad, you know, every so often, we, he would um, kalu a pig and all his friends would come over. He went fishing with his friends. If we had, my dad got extra fish, he'd share it with the neighbors. Even though he had all these kids yes, in Yes, yes. And my mom, she sewed clothes for our friends across the street because you know, they, they didn't have a whole lot of stuff. If we had extra whatever, you know, bananas or whatever, we'd share it with people. Your mom was half Hawaiian, your dad half Hawaiian. Mm -hmm. That was the time when, when people were really trying to be Western, wasn't right, it? Right, right, yeah. They were, some people, you know, they were embarrassed about, you know, the Hawaiian, their Hawaiian effect. Some people, you know, some of my people would say that, um, they were even didn't want to say where they lived. They didn't want to say they lived in Papakolea. And Papakolea didn't really have, you know, a very good reputation. And I think the media tends to, you know, sensationalize and, you know, maximize the negative and minimize the positive, you know. So I was proud. I mean, we had people from Papakolea. Danny Kalekini's family, Iolani Luahine, Hoakale Kamau, Auntie Genoa Keave. We had people who went to the military academies, you know, um, the Kukea family, Kala, Kahele, and his sister Mele. So we had lots of people who, you know, were, were notable people. So they don't talk about all of those things, you know, they talk about the negative things. and. Um, I, I, I had wonderful years there. Parks and Recreation was a really wonderful program. We had a wonderful director, Meli Ikalama, and she was a very, very influential woman in my life, very firm and, and organized and just a wonderful, warm and compassionate, you know. From the time she was a little girl in Papakolea, Sarah Kiahi knew she wanted to become a teacher, and she knew she'd need a good education to accomplish that even though it wouldn't be at the school that comes to mind first. I think everybody who's uh, ever come to your class to learn has probably been surprised if they didn't already know that y you did not attend Kamehameha schools. Right, school. right. You know, my students would say to me, well, Kuma, what year did you graduate? And I would say, I am a proud public school product. What, you didn't come to Kamehameha? And I said, no, I'm, you know, fortunately I didn't, but I'm a proud public school product and I'm, you know, I have no regrets. Roosevelt was a really good school, academically aggressive, and I, I you know, I, I think I, I learned a lot from it, so. As a matter of fact, your mother didn't really want you to go to Kamehameha. Yeah, <laughs> yeah she didn't because, you know, she said to me, well, you know, uh, part of the, the, the girls' training is they learn how to take care of a baby and they learn how to cook and so, and you know how to do that, you know. 
you already know that. I said, but mom, that's not all they learn. They learn the basic stuff. You know, they have to take their classes and math, science, and English, and so forth. So that's in addition to that. Well, she still thought it was, you know. So I said, so I just went to Roosevelt, and which was, you know, a good thing. So I, I enjoyed my years in Poway Elementary and Stevenson mm -hmm. Intermediate in Roosevelt. Right in your neighborhood. Right, Punchbowl. exactly. At that time, there were no career days. There were, uh, kids weren't channeled into, just, you know, try to think now of what you want, might want to do for a living. Right. Was, was that something you gave thought to? Oh, I knew, I knew from the very beginning I wanted to be a teacher. Because? Well, you know, my grandmother, she wasn't a formal teacher, but she did some teaching, and she told me about her experiences teaching. And ever since I was a little girl, my mom said, do you know that you used to call the neighborhood kids and bring them over, and you'd play school? You'd pass out pencils and papers <laughs> and under the house, you know, we had our houses up, and you'd play school, and I said, really? You, you were that. comfortable with having authority because you'd been in charge of a younger brother mm -hmm. and you'd seen your mother as the head right. of uh, the right. household right. In, in, on the homemaking side. But um, my very first teacher at Poe Elementary was Manu Boy's grandmother, um, Julia, Julia Boyd, and she was, and the teachers then were very strict and um, like the Gladys Brandt type people. Mm -hmm who I just admired and loved Gladys Brandt, but they were, they were um, Hapa Haole teachers and very, very, you know, strict. Did and, you get um, in trouble? Oh, no, no. I was such You're a, always a good student. I know. My, my brothers and sisters tease me. Says, You're such a goody two-shoes, you know. He's, and I guess I liked school, and I, I did well in school. I studied hard. Mm -hmm. It didn't yeah. come to me naturally. I mean, I had to study hard, and I did because I, I really enjoyed it. All my friends said, you're so studious, and, you know, at, at Roosevelt, I was, you know, um, kidded about that, how studious I was. I was the one that didn't go out very much. You know, I was such a homebody. I, I wasn't a real social kind of person. Like, you know, I, um, I didn't care to go to proms or stuff like that. My brothers and sisters would say, oh, you're just, you know, you, we go to the beach and there you are under a tree reading a book or something, you know. But um, I mean, I, I went in, I went in the water and all that. But I just wasn't um, as perhaps as uh, active as they were. But we did go hiking, you know. We lived in Papakole and behind our house up the mountains in Tantalus, and we explored all the trails. Sarah Kiahi had always wanted to learn Hawaiian so she could speak the language with her grandmother, who was a Manaleo, a native speaker. After graduating from Roosevelt High School, Sarah Kiahi enrolled at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, where she had her first opportunity to learn the Hawaiian language in a formal setting. Now, was Hawaiian spoken in the house at all? Well, my grandmother spoke Hawaiian with my mom sometimes, and I was fascinated because, you know, I, I would talk to my grandmother a lot, ask her zillions of questions, and I and I, I really did want to to you know learn Hawaiian, and it wasn't until I went to the university that you know I saw Hawaiian 101. I'm going to take this, but my mom spoke Hawaiian with my grandmother, and my dad spoke sometimes. And the only time they spoke Hawaiian is when they were scolding. Scolding, scolding, like but, they would scold us, and you would know what it meant. And we knew all the all the scolding, like you know, kuli kuli, and you know some of those things. But what does kuli kuli mean? It's the not so nice way of saying be quiet. It's more like shut up, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and um, so we knew those kinds of things. You were spoken to in Hawaiian as a way of scolding you, but it was also kind of a secret language too among yeah. the adults. And well, yes, because like when friends would come over or my grandmother would talk with her friends, it was all in Hawaiian, you know. And it was the adult language. Yeah, they never really sat down and taught you anything because that's not how they do it, mm -hmm. you know. If you're interested, you would sit down and listen. But it wasn't until I was in college and when I started studying Hawaiian and then, you know, I think the day when I could understand my grandmother was just like, oh, yes, you know. She was a Manaleo. She, yes, she, she was a so, Manaleo. And you were learning textbook Hawaiian. Right. But I had my grandmother to practice with. I was really fortunate because when I was um, in, at the university, 
Um, I worked in the recording lab at the Muse British, uh, Bishop Museum and with Eleanor Williamson, who was like my second mom to me. And Ellie worked with Kavena Pukui, and they went on the road and they interviewed native informants. So I got to go. And Kavena wanted to interview my grandmother because she knew my grandmother. They were in the Royal Society together. And she said, I haven't seen Grandma for a long time. I think we should, I should go interview her. So I went with them up to my grandmother's house and did the interview. And so on the way back to the museum, Kavena said to me, you know, you know, Grandma used so many words I haven't heard for so long. You know, it's so nice to hear those words again. I said, they're probably archaic, right? <laughs> Only you native speakers know those words. And, um, you know, my grandmother was a really fascinating woman because she was born when Kalakaua was king. And she lived through the provisional government. She lived through the, the republic the territory and 10 years into statehood. Wow. So she saw what all was her of those take on um, statehood. Well, she told me that on the day of annexation, on the day that the um, annexation down at the palace, um, you know, the women who came, and she said, as they saw their flag coming down, they wept, and they thought they would never see their flag again. So they all went home and made Hawaiian flag quilts. <laughs> And my grandmother made one. She made one. And I remember there was a time when Napua Stevens was having a program at the Ilikai, and she announced that she would honor Lili U's birthday. Anyone who has a Hawaiian flag quilt in their family, if they would bring it forth, and they would have a display of them. So mom took grandma's quilt, and it was incredible because as you looked at all the different quilts, there was no two alike. We still have that in our family, Grandma's Hawaiian flag quilt. She signed the petition against annexation. I have a copy of it with her signature. You know, she said the queen was imprisoned in her own home and, um, and how it was done. I'm amazed because to me, Lili Okalani epitomizes humility. That in the song she wrote, The Queen's Prayer, um, in verse three, she says to her people that, um, you know, let's not look at the evils of men, but let's forgive them for what they did. I mean, that to me is, you know, Lili was just an incredible woman, and I really admire her a lot. Earlier you said that your, your grandmother didn't like the way it was done, right. but did she come to think that annexation <clears throat> was a good thing? Um, well, I think you know, down the road, she did say to me that um, other powers were looking at us too. You know, she said, the Russians were here, you know, they mm -hmm. had built the fort. The French were here. Um, I said to her, well, what about the British? Don't you think the British might have been a good thing? You know, <laughs> I mean, look, Vancouver gives Kamehameha a flag, and Kamehameha asks, what is this? And he says, it's, our, it's a symbol of our country. So Kamehameha has a Hawaiian flag made, and that's why the Union Jack is in the, in the corner of the Hawaiian flag. So um, I said, what about England? What if we were English, you know, under England? And as well, you know, it, it could have been, but, you know, and, but I think she was, she was, um, I think she was, you know, kind of came to terms with, being part of um, the U.S. Was, was there a Hawaiian major when you entered no, the UH? No, in fact, I had to go see the dean. It was Dr. Elbert who actually um, encouraged me to, to consider Hawaiian. This is Samuel Elbert. Yes, Sam who Elbert. Who wrote, co-wrote the Hawaiian Dictionary. Yes, and everything else, place names. What, what was he like? Warm, you know, kind, compassionate, person. I loved him. Um, I remember when I walked in, I saw Hawaiian 101. I told my grandmother, Grandma, I'm taking, I'm signing up for Hawaiian 101. And she said, Hawaiian at the university? I said, yeah. So I walked into class and, and there was this old man of gray, white hair, dark skin. And I thought, wow, he looks like a Hawaiian grandpa, you know? <laughs> and I sat right in front of him and, and and I looked at him and I smiled and, and he introduced himself 
And then he said, he said, you know, I am not Hawaiian. And everybody was like, really? He said, I am full Danish. And he taught you your first Hawaiian language class? Mm -hmm. He called me up one day after class and he said, now what, what do you want to do when you, when you um, in college? I said, well, you know, Dr. Albert, I'm gonna be a teacher. He said, oh, my kai, my kai. And I said, he said, well, do you know what kind? I said, well, I'm thinking English. He looked at me, he said, English? <laughs> English? He said, he said, what about Hawaiian? And I said, Hawaiian? There were no schools teaching Hawaiian, you know. It seemed like bum advice because yeah, you couldn't get I'm a job. Being, Dr. Elmer, <laughs> there's no, nobody that I know except the university. And he looked at me and he said, there will be a day. Mm. And I was like, and he just looked at me, there will be a day. And he was right. And he was right. Sarah Kiahi continued her English and Hawaiian studies at the university on her way to becoming a teacher. She was set to be a student teacher at Farrington High School in Kalihi during her senior year when she received a phone call that changed everything. When it was time to student teach, teach I got this call from a um, Donald Mitchell from Kamehameha Schools. And he said, um, you don't know who I am, but I know who you are. And I said, oh, really? And he said, I uh, would like to, I know you're going to be ready for student teaching next year, and I would like for you to come to Kamehameha and student teach. I said, really? Wow. I said, I'm already assigned to Farrington, you know, with Marion Leloy. And he said, yes, I know. And I talked with the university people, and they said, if it's OK with you, it's fine. So I got to student teach with Dr. Mitchell, and that was just transformative in my life. That that man was just an incredible. You I mean, had I, already heard of him. I didn't until I got there. And then you know? he turned out to be. Yeah, uh, because uh, then I changed your life. Yes, because see, if you were a Kamehameha student, you would have known him, but I wasn't. See, so mm -hmm. I was on the, and so when I got there and really mentored by him and he was just an incredible person. I consider him Mr. Hawaiian Studies at Kamehameha. I really do because um, if, if it weren't for him, you know, and Antinona Beamer, those two people just welcomed me with open arms and uh, thus, you know, we began a wonderful relationship. And Dr. Mitchell wasn't even Hawaiian, you know. He was from Kansas. Um, but he, he was culturally Hawaiian. I student taught with him, and then he went on sabbatical, and I, I taught, and he would come and sit in my language class. And he would actually come and sit in my language class, and then I'd go sit in his culture class and learn everything that I could, and I think so it was a really wonderful relationship. What was there of Hawaiian language at Kamehameha when you went there, I think, in 1966? Yes, nothing. We proposed to a requirement in Hawaiian culture and history for years, seven years, I think it took. Nothing happened, nothing happened. Then the Hawaiian community, you know, got involved in it. But I think when they did a graduate survey, and the graduates said, the five-year graduate survey, that they were deficient. The school prepared them well for math and science and all that, but they were totally deficient when it came to um, anything Hawaiian, and as they were in college in the mainland and people would ask them questions, they couldn't answer them intelligently. Like, where did the Hawaiians come from? Or could you say something, could you speak your language, or do you, is there a language? Or, I mean, they were embarrassed. So the graduates said that they were really deficient, and, and finally they, the requirement materialized. And you were no easy teacher. You were no softy. Ooh. You, I, I mean, I've, I've, I've known that? so, yes, yeah. I've known so many of your students who, um, yeah. who, who just admire you greatly. They, they say she's tough but fair. And, yeah. and you're really adorable, except when you're really not happy. With, <laughs> you know, uh, you have, you're, you have high standards yeah. and you're just not gonna, yeah. not gonna accept less. Right, exactly. I said, you know, you cannot expect maximum grade if you put minimum work, you know? It doesn't work that way. When I started in 1966, I was the only teacher. I couldn't take sabbaticals because there was no one to replace me, 
you know, so I had to put it off and put it off. And finally, you know, I was able to take a sabbatical, but I'm really happy to say that when I started, you know, yes, it was only me for years and years and years. And when I retired, there were like 10 full-time Hawaiian language teachers. And you taught them all, and I most bet. of them were my <laughs> former students. Yes, I'm so proud of that. Like I could pass the baton. And yet she is still Kumu Keahi. Even though Sarah Keahi has retired from teaching, she continues to share her knowledge with the community, including serving as senior editor of the Hawaiian Bible Project. Not only was she able to share her love of the language through her work on the Hawaiian Bible manuscript, she calls this the best job she ever had because she got to work at home in a t-shirt and shorts. Mahalo to Hawaiian language champion and retired groundbreaking Kamehameha Schools teacher Sarah Kiahi of Honolulu for sharing your stories with us. And thank you for joining us. For PBS Hawaii and Long Story Short, I'm Leslie Wilcox. Aloha hui ho. For audio and written transcripts of all episodes of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, visit pbshawaii.org. To download free podcasts of Long Story Short with Leslie Wilcox, go to the Apple iTunes Store or visit pbshawaii.org. If you look across the state, um, a lot of people in, in the Hawaiian world and the Hawaiian language field and um, are Kamehameha graduates. And I'm really happy about that, you know, because they, and I said to them, you know, you need to share what you know and go out there and, and um, um, spread the aloha, you know, and, and help your people, help your people.